Well, thank you everyone for joining our 2020 virtual night out for safety and liberation in partnership with the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights. My name is Atticus Garden. I have the distinct privilege to serve as an area commissioner with the city of Columbus Southside Area Commission representing the wonderful, beautiful and diverse District 2 or Southern Orchards, the host of today's event. Just a couple of housekeeping items before I introduce Christian, who will be facilitating today's session. I uh, just want to remind you to please keep yourself muted during the session. Um, if at any point you have any questions, we will have a Q&A uh, time at the end. Um, uh, but if you have any immediate questions, you can place them in the chat. Um, I also midway through the session will post a hashtag safety is survey in the comments um, after a little bit of feedback from some folks. Um, a couple simple questions, just your information. Um, if for some reason due to time constraints, there's a question you're not able to uh, have answered or that you don't feel comfortable asking in this setting, you can fill out your question in the survey uh, and we'll make sure that uh, Minister Hopkins uh, gets your contact information, your email and your question for him to follow up with you. Um, also, there's a question that asks you what safety means to you. And then there's a follow-up question uh, asking if it's okay for the Southern Orchard Civic Association uh, to uh, post your response uh, via our social media. That's a part of our hashtag safety is campaign. So we really felt to kind of keep things moving for the next couple of days following today's event. We thought it'd be great to get uh, responses from residents both here in Southern Orchards, throughout the South Side and throughout the city of Columbus. Um, and then be able to post those in a way to engage with folks online. Um, and so the questions uh, worded a little oddly, I apologize. Um, I think I wrote it last night at like 1 a.m. in the morning. But um, if you would not mind completing that survey, I would appreciate it. Um, and also I will post uh, the uh, list of uh, today's schedule and the remaining events. Um, and I hope that you can join us for the rest of the day. So that being said, I want to introduce uh, Christian Goodrich, who is uh, the chair of the uh, Planning and Development Committee for the Southern Orchard Civic Association. He is uh, by trade an engineer uh, here in Columbus, Ohio, and a, a resident of the neighborhood for the past, uh, well, how long have you lived here for now, Christian? Uh, it's been three and a half years now. Three and a half years. And his wonderful uh, wife, uh, Ashley, who will be leading our next session um, 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 is the vice president of our civic association. So anyways, that being said, I'm gonna let Christian uh, introduce Minister Hopkins and um, thanks so much uh, for being here, Christian. All right, well, thank you very much, Atticus. That was a very, very good introduction. I, I appreciate it. Um, so I have the distinct pleasure here of introducing everyone to uh, Minister Hopkins. Uh, Minister Hopkins is a father of six children, civic leader, and champion for the South Side, where he currently serves as a minister at the Family Missionary Baptist Church located in Southern Orchards. Hopkins also serves as an area commissioner with the South Side Area Commission and is a chair of the Religious and Sur Social Services Committee. Hopkins is a graduate of the South Side Neighborhood Leadership Academy, a visionary and a man of faith. Hopkins has worked to leverage the existing assets on the South Side to help those in his community achieve their hopes, dreams, and aspirations. So please, uh, Mr. Hopkins, uh, get us started. Thank you. Oh, good evening to you, uh, Mr. Christian, and to uh, Mr. Atticus, and, and uh, to all of those that are taking part of this 2020 uh, virtual um, night out for safety and liberation. Uh, I'm truly honored to be here and to be part of this event uh, here on the south side of Columbus, uh, uh, south side two words. And so grace and peace to you all. And um, like I said, I'm honored to be here and to be able uh, just to speak and uh, to uh, engage everyone about a wonderful experience that I've had uh, in my civic relationship. And that's with the uh, NLA as we call it. And that's the Neighborhood Leadership Academy. And so we're going to talk more specifically uh, about the South Side Neighborhood Leadership Academy. And, um, and so even as I get ready to dive into that, uh, I do want to just give you a little bit more uh, background and framework about um, uh, this road, uh, this pathway that got me started in the uh, Leadership Academy, because I know that there may be someone out there that's listening whose path was much like mine, uh, mine started in my ministry lane uh, at Family Missionary Baptist Church when uh, my pastor, Frederick uh, Lamar, 
had partnered me with a civic uh, leader in the community uh, because he, you know, he shared that, you know, our relationship with the community can't always just be up in the church, but uh, we need to have a balance in the community because that is the axis of the cross uh, and we need to have that balance. And so he had connected me with uh, a really great leader on the South side uh, within my civic where I have lived uh, for 30 years now and raised those six children and uh, got a bunch of grandkids. Uh, but uh, he partnered with uh, Miss Deborah Diggs, who is a, 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 a powerful leader here on the South side. And I came in uh, just as a resident, uh, very nervous, not having a civic voice and not sure how to fit in that lane because civic was totally new to me. Uh, I was all about faith-based and uh, not knowing how to express myself. And uh, the opportunity came up about this NLA, this Leadership Academy, and it had goals of uh, um, opening you up to new ideas, uh, enriching you with uh, some fundamental um, um, empowerments to help you be able to express yourself uh, in your community. And that was one of the main goals that uh, I had just being a resident of the community. Uh, I know when I came into the meeting, I uh, into the civic uh, meetings, there was always a statement I heard. They, they talked about those people, those people. And I was sitting in the back of the room. And then I later found myself uh, moving to the front of the people because I had identified myself as one of those people. And so um, in the in the conversations of the Leadership Academy of which I started, um, my alumni started in 2014 with United Way of Central Ohio um, in that, in that uh, lane of the Leadership Academy. And the main thing we focused on at that time was um, diversity. And, uh, and it exposed me some, to some ideas that I always thought I knew were diverse was and I had always classified it as being, you know, it's either black or white, and um, and I never looked past diversity in seeing it in any other way, and and it was always a color-based type thing, and so uh, in this leadership academy and that being structured to be a leader in your community, we started looking at what was really diversity, and started really exploring that and. Um, and that's one thing that even the Southside Leadership Academy, which I am going to tell you more about in a minute, uh, exposes you to some places right in your community that you oftentimes did not realize that it existed, uh, were unaware of its rich, diverse culture, and some things that were happening right in your community that you weren't aware and never really celebrated, and, uh, and even some lanes where even in your diversity, you were hindering community growth. And so one thing that we uh, focused on there and also in the Southside Neighborhood Leadership Academy is about the ABCD of uh, community. And it's uh, asset-based uh, community development and recognizing, you know, you've always heard the proverbial, uh, is, the, is the shaker or the glass half full or is it half empty? And it all depends on your perspective and uh, the way that you look at it. You know, you can either see it half empty and, hey, there's never enough resources, or you can begin to look at it and say, well, hey, this is the resources that we do have. How can I make my community better um, with the assets that I have? And then also uh, one, of the, one of the things you have to do is begin to learn how to identify those assets in your community. And, you know, uh, we did a little exercise in the, in the Leadership Academy. Um, of us identifying what are the assets and what are the things that you can say bring strength to your community. And uh, we did that thing. And, and one thing we noticed was a lot of people never put their self down as one of those assets in the community. They never identified themselves as one of the strengths. Like, hey, I, I've got a voice in my community. Uh, is my voice strong or do I have a message or do I have a story? And um, a story to tell and am I willing to share it? Am I willing to get it out of that glass or out of that shaker that it can begin to enrich? And so uh, one thing that the Leadership Academy did is um, it, uh, 
it started showing me diversity in was not just in color, but it's in culture, it's in ideas, um, it's in um, oh gosh, oh it's it, even in in food, you know, in the the, the rich diversity of eating in the community and what ways uh, and the diverse ways that we can bring strength to a community, what assets uh, exist in the community and identifying those. And so um, in, in the Leadership Academy, and so we, we, uh, we took some great bus rides. We took uh, some tours and we went into those communities uh, that were right, you know, right in the community. And so uh, I, I, um, I went in, we went into a community of the Hispanic uh, community and we went into their dining space and uh, it was, uh, oh gosh, um, um, oh gosh, I forgot the name of it, uh, but um, La Michicana. And we met the, the family of La Michicana and it was a family-based uh, uh, Hispanic restaurant and uh, they, they supplied groceries for their community uh, groceries that were traditional to to their community, their community, uh, the Hispanic community knew to identify them uh, as a place where they could access the things that were important to them. Uh, and uh, we even had some, we experienced some fine dining with them. And so we also went to a, a mosque and uh, we, uh, we interacted with the Muslim community uh, and uh, and the schooling and how they had a central place right in their community for learning, uh, for development, uh, for cooking, and we experienced some of their um, some of their ideas and to and to share with them. Uh, we also went into a, a Somalian community that it, and it was right there and the structure and they had their own civic government and uh, um, assisting their their community of Somalians, of how to uh, access resources that were important to them and to their culture, um, even in a space where they uh, were able to um, talk about this uh, new, new American culture and what things they could do to begin to strengthen themselves within the community that um, they could likewise bring strength into the community as a whole. And so that was one of the main things. And so even coming into the Civic Association um, and one of the facilitators showed us a good point. And, and maybe you've seen this too, that a lot of people have good ideas about what they want in their community. And uh, we, see it, we see it happening even in this election cycle. And sometimes people can get so adamant about what it is that they want and how it is uh, that they believe things should be changed. And so they have this idea and um, they stick with their idea. But then on the other side, you have someone else that's just as adamant about their community and about uh, how, about what things they think that their community or the beliefs or the structure of things should happen. And so that's diverse, you know, and we see it uh, within the Republican and Democratic structure that you have a base of ideas. And, um, and so one thing we did in this, in a, one of our workshops is you bring your diverse topic to the table and the other one would bring their diverse topic. And, uh, people really passionate about this idea and we talked about it. And so as long, and what we found out was um, as long as you come to the table with your idea and you're never willing to hear what the other person is talking about and how it is that we can begin to work together, you're going to leave the meeting with your same diverse idea and you're going to go back and you won't have made any ground towards coming towards the middle. And so we worked on that ex exercise, like what could I have done in the meeting or what could I have said to move the conversation a little closer that we might get things done? Because as long as you have your idea and you don't have respect of their idea and they come and they don't have respect of your idea, you're just gonna go back back, back home or go back to where uh, you were at to your, you know, in your community 
and uh, you'll you'll still be talking about what you're talking about. The other person will be talking about what they're talking about, and we're never able to uh, get things done if we're not able uh, to have a strategy where we can uh, build in community. And so those were some of the things that we learned in the community in the Neighborhood Leadership Academy uh, was about community strategic planning and about restorative practices, about how you could, uh, um, in a social science uh, studies, uh, how to improve and repair relationships between people and communities and learn how to build uh, healthy communities and increase social uh, capacity and, and capital and decrease crime and, uh, and anti-social behavior and repair harm and, uh, and restore relationships. And so that was the main thing was restoring relationship because everyone wants a safe community, but we find that safety looks different to, um, to many people. Everybody has their own view of safety. And if we are not respectful of what safety is to this person uh, and you know, knowing what safety is to you and then how do I accomplish this safety in our community, um, it, it often leaves you with um, some lanes where there is, uh, you know, where tempers start to boil over. Um, people become so entrenched in what they believe that um, it, it, it is not conducive and uh, it becomes challenging. And so uh, we also talked about um, transformative community engagement, you know, having, having real talk conversations and not just, uh, not just talking, but coming with a, a mindset ready uh, to engage the, the tough questions um, the tough realities, um, finding out some things about ourselves that we did not know existed, and then how can we move the needle from where I am to where we need to be? And so um, there's all there's a lot of times there's places in your community that you've often had a preconceived idea about that that neighborhood or about that space or um, about that area, but until you begin to venture into that space, that you begin to know the people, that you begin to establish a relationship with them, know them and know what challenges they face and, and hear and really have an ear to hear um, what it is is, is hindering them um, in moving their agenda that it would also help move yours. And so um, one of the things that I really, I really enjoyed out of uh, the Neighborhood Leadership Academy and uh, some of those same core principles uh, that, uh, in the, that the United Way Neighborhood Leadership Academy um, had established, you know, also is embedded in the Southside Neighborhood Leadership Academy where uh, Ms. Caitlin Hansen of the Community Development for All People um, was the director and she was at that table uh, when they were forming that. Some of the, of the great other larger stakeholders in the community were at that table, even in the development of Southside Neighborhood Le Leadership Academy. And so one thing that I really um, found um, pivotal and I still, you know, I still today have found it to be a great tool in my tool belt, and is and so we went to um, we went to COSI where WOSU had some studios there, and we talked about capturing a person's story, and being able um, listening with purpose, and and having an ear to hear what you know. Don't be so ready to tell your story. Go into the meeting with a, a, a with a mindset ready to hear what that other person has to say and let them tell their story and um man we and we, we you know we went into the franklin franklinton area and uh what you know um typically a lot of people knows the franklinton area as the bottoms that's that's what i grew up with you know they call that the bottoms that's franklinton area um but we never knew why they called it the bottoms and so we were exposed in that in that leadership academy 
of let's find out why it's called the bottoms and let's find out the history of it. And so we went to some of the um, seniors in the community and some of the storytellers. And we found out that, you know, that used to be the center of government for Ohio. And the reason why it was called the bottoms is because that's where, you know, we have the confluence rivers, they come together. And those two great rivers would always flood in that area. And so that was, uh, they said that is some of the most rich, so richest soil in the state of Ohio, because that's all that farmland, that silt that grew, um, came down to the bottoms. And so that was the lowest part uh, at the, where those two rivers came together and they would overflow. And so it was called the bottom. And, uh, but uh, um, it was a person, Franklinton was his name and he was a, a, a old preacher. And he came and recognized that uh, land as something being fertile and uh, established it as, uh, uh, I believe it was called, Frank. it was Franklinton before it was Columbus. And, but it was Columbus and that was the center. But it was just listening to that story of, you know, um, a lot of people put a negative connotation on the bottoms and without knowing the, the true story. And so, um, you know, we have a lot of Native Americans that are in, uh, in the city and in our communities. And so uh, on the Southside Neighborhood Leadership Academy, I did not know, and, and I found out on one of our field trips that right here on the South Side, uh, over in the Barthman area, I believe it is, um, uh, over off of South High Street, that the Native American Indians, uh, specifically one tribe, has a headquarters over there. And so in one of our classes, one of our leadership classes, we had a gentleman that was part of that uh, um, part of that Native American tribe. And, and it was something just to hear, hear him tell his story. And so um, in that, in that acid-based um, community development, we recognize it is all of those rich coming together of ideas, um, experiences, um, influence uh, that they come together and um, and they strategically give strength. And so um, just a little bit more about the Southside Neighborhood Leadership Academy. And so I, um, I was privileged to be at that table when they were developing that uh, because I had been a resident of the Southside for those 30 plus years and uh, I was not always at the economic level that I am now, you know, um, not that I, I just got one more nickel to rub together than be, I had before, but at that time I had a whole lot of economic challenges uh, as being a young uh, African American with six young children. And uh, I moved to where I am now on Wilson and Deschler because I wanted a, a little something more for my family. And when I moved to that community, uh, it was more homes and more families. Uh, at that time, you had a, a factory, um, not uh, not Owens, Illinois. Uh, oh gosh, um, it was a factory um, uh, right in our community, and you also had uh, um, uh, Columbus Castings, but it was Buckeye Steel at the time. But um, there was a, a great blend of families in that area. And so uh, I was able to move my family into that area. And, um, you know, uh, I always tell the story, you know, we, we lived in that house for 17 years before I realized I was at the economic level that I could buy that house. And so being a man of faith, you know, we, we prayed about it and uh, um, we, we, we actually went to a bank and we found out, am I able? And, uh, you know, because of some of the other conversations that was going on in the community that I had been exposed to about what does that look like for me to, to purchase a home? Nobody ever told me I could purchase a home. And here it is, I had rented this house for 17 years and, you know, my house was the Kool-Aid house. And this, all the people, all the young folks would gravitate to my house and we kept an eye on all of those children, but um, you know, it was a safe place in the community, much like uh, one of the things we talk about, where's that third place at in your community? 
So uh, my house was the third place in the community. Seemed like everybody, we going over to Hopkins house. But um, my kids had, you can imagine six young children, uh, you know, and uh, we weren't that structured. We ain't where we's at now. We ain't, we ain't where we are now. And so um, the, my kids had destroyed this, you know, they had did some wear and tear on this house. And here it is, now we have the opportunity to buy that house and we could have moved out of this house, but we recognize the value of this community, you know, and, and I literally, as that man of faith, heard, heard that, hey, it was good enough to raise your children in all these years. Why would you move out now? Because you, you think that you're at a greater status level, you, you know, you making more money or, or whatever, but you know, my son had graduated from uh, South High School. Uh, my oldest uh, had graduated from South High School. Some of the other children had uh, went on to independence and graduated, but now it was at the point, hey, you can buy that house. And so uh, we bought that house. And so we've um, uh, since then have been able to purchase some other property, you know, surrounding my house because we were, um, we saw the value in the community and wanted to be able to do our own uh, com community building and uh, being able to control the environment of even where my living was. And, um, you know, we knew the neighbors that lived there before and they were such wonderful neighbors. And we were just wondering, well, who's going to move in there now? And so as landlords, we wanted to make sure um, that we were doing our due part of uh, helping to build community and giving some, you know, much like we talk about affordable housing now, you know, we have not raised the rent on that property and it is a reasonable, um, you know, uh, it is an affordable um, mortgage, you know, rent, rent right now. And so, um, let me see, let me get a check on time because I can talk now. <laughs> um, but at, at that time, when I when I started in the Leadership Academy, I, I did not have a voice that I'm speaking with now. I would not, I used to sit in the back of the meetings and uh, I was not always so willing to share my voice or to share my story. Um, and it wasn't so much that it was, um, you know, and, and so some say, you you know, it's not about being, ashamed of where you come from, but you didn't realize the value of where you came from. Because I'm very proud that, you know, I grew up in a two, two parent home. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I had some, some great role models in my parents. And I recognize that those values have now um, came into my life. Me and my wife have been married for 38 years. And, you know, out of my six children, um, four Four of them are married, um, and I have 22 grandchildren. And uh, most of uh, five of my children still live within the community, uh, Southside, and they are also invested in the community. And um, they are also stakeholders, and as well as part of that asset-based uh, community development. And so, you know, they are property owners. They have a voice. Their voice don't always line up with mine, but they have a voice. And, uh, and so uh, we're glad that they have, um, you know, they have ideas that they're willing to express and um, they're willing to get into the conversation. Um, um, and so they, you know, and it's been wonderful. And so I am currently the, the civic president of Southside Community Action Network. Some know it as Southside Can. And uh, our boundaries, uh, much like Southern Orchards, is uh, Parsons Avenue uh, to Lockbourne Road. Uh, Whittier, we share that boundary of Whittier Avenue, and our southern boundary is uh, Freebus Avenue. And so, you know, those are some large. It's a large, uh, a large community, and so uh, that's District Four. And so, within that District Four, we now have um, like five other. Uh, communities and civic associations that are also represented within those boundaries. And so uh, you have Edgewood Acres, um, you have Ganther's Place, um, South Central Commons is in that area, um, Thurman Square, um, seem like I'm missing someone, um, 
but you have a, a rich, diverse uh, community there. And uh, our ideas is not always the same ideas as the next, but we respect them as much as we want to have them respect our ideas. Um, we know that our community is changing and uh, it, it is changing. And so um, we, we really celebrate the voice that Southside can has had for all of these years. Um, some of you may be familiar with Dan Charles uh, who did some really great work here on the South side. Um, he was one of the great assets uh, of the community, much as like we have uh, Pastor Edgar. And so I, that was that was just a, a little funny, you know, when we all were identifying the assets in your community, see my like everybody had Pastor Edgar as one of the community assets and that that is true. And so um, we, we, we know we have Donato's Pizza and the Grody family within our boundaries and uh, we have uh, some of the other great assets that are on the community, on the South side, you know, you have Crane Plastics and um, where well, they integrated uh, engineer profiles. Uh, the great work that United Way is still doing here on our South side community. Um, oh, uh, we have a new organization that is really um, helping in this community to continue to thrive. And so that is one of the things that uh, in community strategic planning, this is an organization that has brought stakeholders together and it's called Southside Thrive Collaborative. And so I am on that leadership team. Um, uh, you know, I came in with a quiet voice when you have such prominent and great stakeholders uh, that were at the table. Um, and I looked at myself like, you know, I'm just a resident of the South Side, but that was something to be celebrated. And I had a story to tell. And so that story is still, you know, opening up some other doors. And I was going somewhere with that. Uh, um, the South Side Thrive Collaborative is continuing to help this rich mosaic of communities here on the South Side to thrive. Um, I don't, um, I didn't really have a PowerPoint put together. I'm not sure if Christian, have you got that? Uh, I'm not sure if Atticus sent that over. Uh, yeah, there was- I'll, uh, I'll post uh, the link for the Southside Neighborhood Leadership Academy in the comments and, and okay. the folks can view it, yep. Okay, and so, um, and, and so Atticus, uh, we have uh, some really great alumni and uh, people that are doing some great work that have uh, on the South side uh, of which Mr. Atticus Garden is one of them. Uh, and we know that he, he was already a great asset even when he came into the Leadership Academy, but the stories and the strengths that he had helped to empower somebody else that was in the Leadership Academy. And that's the way it works. And so my pastor uh, shares the principle that iron sharpens iron. And so, uh, we're grateful to have great tools um, uh, as Atticus. And so I, I have to throw my buddy's name out there, uh, Mike Alcott and um, Southside Stay. And he's also one of the commissioners doing great work and they're great voices, even in the educational realm, you know, that our, our youth and uh, the influence that this community uh, is um, being um, influenced by. And so we take all of those factors. I could go on and on and talk about um, that asset-based uh, community development for you to be able to identify um, identify those strengths in your community. And so just one other thing about the Southside Leadership Academy, uh, they you do um, t um, 10 classes of about four hours a uh, piece is usually on, a, it is on a Saturday morning. You take a great bus tour. You see some of those uh, uh, places you did not know was going on on the South side. Um, and uh, you come up with a project in a team-based uh, um, team form. And um, it is uh, something that some of the stakeholders, uh, we know we have the great nationwide uh, Children's Hospital puts resources behind those projects. I know Donato's has been a contributor 
And then also, I think Fifth Third Bank has uh, uh, put some things around um, United Way's uh, efforts. And But you do a project, and there has been some really great projects that are still ongoing today that is now assisting other Southside families and residents and helping them to not only find their voice, but to express the voice and the impact of who they are, you know, because we Southside, y'all. And that's a great place to be, live, and to work your, uh, raise your family in a safe environment. Now, I know we got stuff going on, but those are things that we just have not fully addressed. And there's somebody's voice out there. We need your voice. We need you at the table, uh, finding uh, you finding those skills to uh, hone yourself where you could be on the area commission in your civic meetings. You can be that civic uh uh, board member or just a person uh, I heard in the last meeting, uh, Atticus uh, um, and uh, Miss Merchant were talking about how you have conversations on your front porch. You know, you could be involved in those conversations that help transform your community. Um, and uh, let me say this, we don't want to be those groups on your porch where you look side eyed at the other porch, you know, but we're a porch where we're inviting others to come over to the porch and not just being divisive uh, in our conversations, but um, creating spaces where we can talk about what we need to talk about. Okay. And so um, Atticus, maybe there is something that you wanted to share about your experience uh, as an NLA, is that fair? Am I putting you on the spot, May? No, I, I actually I wanted to share something, but I wanted and then I wanted to I wanted to take it back to you. Um, uh, you know, I graduated in the class of 2018, but I remember the first time that I heard this term asset based community development or the ABCDs. I was at an event um, as a you know newly returned resident of of the South Side because I was born and raised in this community uh, for but only for a couple of years and only moved back a few years ago. Um, I remember hearing Reverend Edgar from uh, Community Development for All People here in Southern Orchards at Whittier and Parsons discussing this term. And I remember being blown away because in and of itself, the, the concept is very simple and it shouldn't, it shouldn't surprise anyone that this is the way that we would develop a community, but it's ingrained into our minds from a very young age that if there's a problem you know, essentially you do whatever you have to do to fix it. Even if that means kind of bringing in, you know, outside forces. Um, and certainly that analogy doesn't work in, in every example, but in community development, you know, hearing terms like gentrification, and that means something different to different people. But I kind of look at that as the sense that you're bringing in outside forces to determine the needs of communities. Um, versus asset-based community development, which is looking at the assets that exist within your own community and the greatest asset being the people uh, and finding out what the needs are of the community from the people who uh, give direction to the development of, of you know, that neighborhood, that area. And I remember hearing, hearing kind of speak about the glass half full versus half empty you know, and the way you view your, your community matters. And, you know, some people would say, well, what does it matter? The same amounts in the glass, but, uh, you know, looking at your community half full, half full versus half empty. Um, and that through this form of development, the ABCDs asset-based community development, um, you can truly bring the, the necessary opportunities to the people in that community that, that can help them not just survive, but thrive. Um, and, and it was through the leadership Academy that I came to really understand what that looked like. And I just, I just remember being like completely and utterly blown away hearing him, of course, so elegantly speak about this subject. Um, and, you know, I look at my own community and Aaron, I know you, and I'm, and I'm sure there are others who feel the same way. You know, I, I, I do, I, I worry about what may come of this community. I worry that people, and they already are being displaced, but that more will continue to be. I worry about that. But I think one thing that's really important, and I'm grateful, Aaron, for you for coming and sharing your story, um, being a resident of this community for so long, I think it's important 
that we continue to share this story. I think we need to control the narrative because if we don't control the narrative, somebody else is going to control that narrative for us. So that's those, those outside forces. You know, you talk about uh, Franklinton, you know, and the way people in the city viewed the bottoms. Um, and they only viewed the bottom, they only viewed the bottoms that way because, you know, folks, you know, somebody else managed to get a hold of that narrative and they controlled it. And that the, the stories of the people in those neighborhoods weren't highlighted. They weren't at the center uh, of that. Um, and, and so, you know, that's how that community came to be known. And unfortunately now it's, you know, that community is all but wiped away, you know, to pave way for, you know, new development and, and uh, it's completely changed. So I'm grateful for you sharing your story because I think that's important. And so what I kind of wanted to bounce back to you um, is this, um, you know, how can we operate, you know, a civic association, obviously. So those who live within Southern Orchards can certainly get involved. And that's not the only way I, I want to, you know, recognize there are many ways to engage in a community. It doesn't just have to be through a civic association, but I'm about the big ask. I, I always like uh, to make the big ask with my, my work in campaign work. So what, what's the big ask that you would have for people watching this right now or people who are going to watch it uh, once we upload it? Uh, what ask do you have of them? And I understand that's a, that's, that's very broad but um, what, do, what do we want to ask of the people who live within our own communities? And I, I'm leaving it broad on, on, on purpose. Um, and, and I guess that big ask for me, and, and it's based in uh, a principle of faith for me. And, you know, and it goes back to that golden rule that first you acknowledge, you know, you in a spirit of humility recognize that one that's greater than you and then you would just begin to the same way you would want to be treated you treat your neighbor the same way and then ask ourselves am i willing to be compassionate enough to ask this person how can i help or and like how can i help and that person you know it may just be in a conversation and so i guess that's you know how can i help I guess that's the big ask because it uh, it is a struggle as a civic president right now is because we're losing a lot of our neighbors uh, through gentrification. Uh, we had some civic leaders that are not at the table anymore. And um, how do you get the, the other residents that's been in the areas that may have some struggles that may need to uh, have their voice developed? How do you get them to the table? And so that's my thing. How can I help? How can I help you get to this point? And how can I empower you that you can begin to empower somebody else? And so I remember it was in the community. It said, each one reach one or each one teach one. And so back to it, how can I help? You know, what can I contribute? If that, you know, if that puts it where um, you needed to, you know, in the question that you're asking, um, um, I just, you know, I, I think we really need to come together as communities and not be so divided, but in a spirit of unity, come together to be able to strengthen the community um, instead of um, isolating communities and it's, it's happening, you know, there's a lot, lot of voices that are being isolated. And so as that civic president of community action network, where and our motto is helping neighbors help neighbors. And so if it can start with a conversation like bro, if you got some overgrown weeds in the back, if you need some help getting that stuff down, let me help you. You know, they may not have the tools to get that done, but instead of us just calling code enforcement on them or starting them arguments about who, who dropped the trash out there by the dumpster and all of that, let's begin to have the conversations because it might just be the busted lid on the trash dumpster that somebody needs to call 311 because the trash may have blew out. But um, how can I help? And uh, just to help build community and not uh, not not be so entrenched in division. Yeah, I know that Beck has a question, so I'm gonna let Christian read that in just just a second. But just while 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 you mentioned that, two things on that. Um, 
I think what's great is that you mentioned the how can I help. And as we talk about both the Neighborhood Leadership Academy and, you know, that being kind of a, uh, an area of the asset based community development, so this kind of concept, you know, in the Leadership Academy, I remember, you know, one of the things was in the Academy near the end, you're placed into groups to create a group project that's going to positively impact your community. Aaron, I'm sure you were part of one, I was a part of one, but I remember it being very clearly that when we created these groups, we weren't to, we weren't to just determine what the community needed from our own perspective. We were instructed to very intentionally go out into the community and engage with residents, engage with other stakeholders, um, and, and to chat with them about what they felt the needs of the community were and to kind of get this sort of multitude, you know, diverse, diverse feedback. And, and again, you mentioned not just racially, but economically um, and, uh, and then go back and kind of determine, you know, what, what this project would look like based off of hearing directly uh, from those within the community. And second, you mentioned about the division, you know, the other aspect of that, and this is why I'm hopeful. I, I mentioned that I was, I'm fearful about displacement because A, it's already occurring, but I'm also hopeful that we can at least remain, uh, have a sense of our history and, and, and keep that history here in this community and keep many residents in our community who wanna remain here. You know, we look at East and West Parsons, which is kind of more recently the sort of natural divide in this community racially, economically, and that, that's just a fact, you know, we, 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 we know that, you know, West Parsons is, you know, uh, is a more affluent uh, community uh, or more, more affluent area. And East Parsons, you know, is diverse again, racially and economically, but not, not nearly quite as affluent. But what's remarkable is, you know, looking at Parsons Avenue, not as a dividing line, but actually as a place where we could come together uh, to engage with one another, you know, looking at Parsons Avenue as an as a place for you know all people, and and you know in in the spirit of you know the work that community development for all people does. So um, um, I I really resonate with the with kind of looking at how you can bridge that divide. Um, I think is really important. So, anyways, uh, I know. Uh, sorry, uh, Christian, go ahead. I know Becca had a question. You're muted. Nice. So uh, I'm just going to read this for everyone here. Um, so Becca Kravitz said, uh, your conversation about communities coming together to learn about others really resonated with her. Uh, and she wanted to ask, what advice do you have for communicating or moderating with folks who aren't willing to come to the table in the first place, or they do so without an open mind? Is there anything that you might have learned in the Leadership Academy that help, could help us? Um, yes, and, and so that, that that's a good question. And um, you know, I kind of knew it before I went to the Leadership Academy, but it was really exposed when I got in the Leadership Academy that, um, and, and so the principle for me is we walk by faith and not by sight. And so if we can show people love greater than we can talk love in our community, and um, if we just lead by example, if you know, for the ones who want it to rain on your parade, if you just go ahead and party in the rain anyway and don't let them rain on your parade, after a while, they're going to want to join your party in the parade. And so one of the things, uh, you know, party in the rain. And so one of the things that we're doing at our church, uh, in spite of the adversity and the challenges in the community, uh, our community was identified as having the most homicides in the city of Columbus. And this was Oh, back in 2008, I believe. Yeah, back in 2008, uh, right here off of Whittier and Oakwood was identified uh, by Mayor Coleman as having the most homicides in the community, I mean, in, in the city. And um, uh, people in the community started crying out for some help and the Family Missionary Baptist partnered with the community and we started a march. And we've been marching now consecutively for uh, these 12 years. And so we just celebrated 100. I think it was we this past Sunday, we had 132nd uh, community march. And so at that community march, you have elected officials that are coming out. You got stakeholders that are coming out. You have residents that are coming out and they're marching with us 
and then we come back to the church and then we talk about um we address those things that um we're marching about and uh, and it's called ministries for movement and and so um and neighbors you know they hear the sound of the drum we have some young men that uh um we found out that people will move to the sound of the beat of the drum you know they'll get rhythmic and um uh, people are more apt and receptive when they hear that. And then they'll come out of their houses and they will march with us. They will come back to the church. And uh, so a lot of great relationships have been formed through this uh, 132 meetings. And um, and so, you know, we were out, uh, we just recently had some homicides in the community uh, this past week. And so, um, you know, the last two weeks. And so we were able to engage with uh um, the civic and uh, other community residents and uh, just come together and talk about at that site where that person lost their life about what things can we do to change what's happening. And so all of those people, they, they just didn't look like me, but it was a diverse uh, coming together of attitudes. Some people were in agreement and some people were not, but we came together and we talked about it. And we prayed about it. So I hope that helped. Um, I hope that answered that question, but leading by example. And sometimes um, we need, you know, uh, uh, one of those great leaders used to, that, you know, um, uh, one of those champions that I, I follow in their footstep, they said, there was a game that we used to play uh, back in elementary school, back in the day, Red Rover, Red Rover, send so-and-so right over. And, you know, we saw all stand there with our arms locked and you wouldn't let a person through. Well, you know, we got to begin to get to the point where we call someone over, hey, you come on over and instead of blocking them, embrace them, lock arms with them, that we can have greater unity in our community, um, that we can begin to really address um, some of those things is going on that we can show up at city council and at our area commission at one as one voice and not as a community that is divided, but we can lock arms and then we can call Red Rover, Red Rover, send change right over, you know, send economic development right over, send greater resources right over, send better education into our schools right over and um, and really uh, come together and um, you know, their, their voice might not always sound like mine, but let's come together in a uh, consensus to get things done. Yeah. Was there any other questions, Christian? Uh, I don't see any right now. Um, okay. But if anyone has any questions, feel free to send them to the chat. So or uh, if you want to say it out loud, I believe you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. They can actually just click unmute. Ah, okay. And and so I will share, even if they might be having a um, opportunity to think about it. One thing that um, it's been my personal ministry in my community. Uh, one thing we've done, we've established a, a community garden and, it, and it's grown into it's an urban farm now that we're addressing a, another one of the challenges in our community is about fresh food access and so we have uh two urban farms in our community on wilson avenue that uh we've been able to provide uh fresh uh fresh fruits and vegetables to our seniors in our community uh it's an environment where people can come together and we named our first garden growing community and family concerns and we've got a, a bench we've got a bench there and it's for the elders that are might not be able to plant anymore but they know how to grow some stuff and there's a whole lot of young people that don't know how to grow some stuff and if if uh we can get it's a place where we do get seniors to come out and they can sit there on that bench and one thing they know how to do they say nah honey you ain't doing it right and they'll show you the way and uh, they'll tell you the story about how it is you get that stuff to grow and what it is you need to do. And they pass on those great histories and uh, that knowledge. And so um, I've grown to learn it as a, a great transference of wealth. Uh, sometimes we just need to sit there and listen to the elders 
And, um, and so we've been having fun in our urban farms. Uh, I don't really have a website or anything to give anybody for that, but um, you can, um, we are on Facebook, um, Growing Community and Family Concerns, and we're in the process of uh, building a, a, a marketing um, for the other one, Family Southside Family Farms. Um, and so it's an engagement place where we can feed our community uh, and try to overcome the food justice. And there's even some social justices in embedded in agriculture that people are not aware of because um, you don't often see 4-H in these inner city communities, but you go to rural areas and they learn about agriculture in a more intense way. And um, this is just an area and it's a passion of mine that I wanna educate some of these young people in the community about agri-science and understanding how ecology works and pollinators and bees and all that stuff. Looks like you got something. Okay. Well, we've been looking like on time. Yeah. Okay. We're about there, ain't we? I, I think so. So if, uh... If there's no other uh, questions, um, thank you, Jeff Mackey, for joining us. But uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Minister Hopkins, for uh, sharing your story tonight and telling us a, a good bit about the uh, Leadership Academy and ways that we can get involved and uh, try to come together, bring our assets to the table, and uh, make a better South Side. Yeah, and, thank you and so again, much for your time tonight. And again, I just want to thank uh, Southern Orchard uh, Civic Association. Uh, for allowing me the opportunity to come on this uh, night of safety and liberation, uh, just to be able to uh, lend my voice uh, on behalf of the Neighborhood Leadership Academy. Definitely contact uh, um, Community Development for All People. I think they have a host site for um, the Leadership Academy. Uh, learn more about them. And there's all kind of alumni in the community um, that are doing great things. Uh, from out of there. So we thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity. Muted. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Christian, uh, for helping facilitate this. And thanks, Minister Hopkins, for being a part of today's session. Uh, I really I really appreciate it. And, and I, I'll make another plug for the Southside Neighborhood Leadership Academy. I put um, the link uh, right there uh, in the comments for you. I have been through much more politically motivated corporate leadership academies that I had to pay to be a part of that were about who you knew. Uh, and it was all about networking. Uh, and I just hated it. <laughs> and so what I'll say is I've, I've never been through a better leadership academy than the Southside Neighborhood Leadership Academy. It doesn't get more community focused than that. And two things. One, if the the term leadership within the name scares you, because, you know, as, as Minister Hopkins mentioned, maybe you don't feel like you have a voice. Maybe you don't feel like you have anything to bring to the table, you know, at this point in your life. That A is just simply not true. If you live in this community or part of this community, your voice matters. And if you feel like you can't find your voice now, I no doubt, no doubt in six months to eight months of that academy, uh, you will have found some of it at least. And two, if the word leadership scares you because um, you're your, maybe you have a voice, but you just don't feel like being a leader. <laughs> um, then, um, you know, I would say that um, we we need folks to step up, and that doesn't mean that you're going to be the figurehead, you know, of your organization, or or you know, uh, maybe it's just a matter of you know planting some trees on your block, or uh, you know, neighborhood cleanups, or hosting a block, you know, block you know get-togethers with your block on your front porch. Um, you know, very, very small uh, acts like these every single day are what truly create community. So I really would encourage you to check out that Leadership Academy. It's really remarkable. Their class right now will be graduating soon, uh, and then they'll be accepting applications for next year's class 2021, which I don't know, probably at this rate is still going to be online. So um, we'll see. With that being said, um, thank you, Minister Hopkins. Um, 
Uh, I uh, encourage uh, all of you uh, to join us again back here at this link starting at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Jasmine Ayers, uh, who's an organizer, community organizer, uh, and also an organizer with the People's Justice Project, who serves on Mayor Ginther's Civilian Review Board Working Group, will be giving us updates. Uh, she actually uh, will have just been getting out of their meeting, which is happening right now. So it'll be fresh on her mind. And then she's also gonna be helping us. We have heard terms like uh, reforming the police, uh, which have been much more in the mainstream for many years. Um, but we've also heard more recently terms like defunding and even as far as abolishment. And you may have your own opinions on that matter, but uh, I think there are a lot of people out there that just don't understand what those terms mean and would find it helpful that those be defined. So Jasmine's gonna be helping to define what those terms mean um, and even what that you know, might mean for you in the short term and even the long term and what that might mean for our community. So really would encourage you to stick around and listen to her. Uh, and then our last session of the day uh, will be from 9.30 or 8.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. We have a representative uh, from Be Quick, the Black Queer and Intersexual uh, Sectional Collective uh, who will be joining us uh, and they will be discussing kind of the history of uh, police in the United States uh, and also talking uh, more from the ab what's called the abolition movement, uh, which is the concept that one day um, uh, we may not need police in our communities and what that would look like. So I encourage you to join us back here at 7 p.m. So what I'm gonna do is uh, thanks again, uh, Minister Hopkins. If you haven't already in the comments section, you'll find our hashtag safety is survey. I ask that you please fill that out uh, for us. We would appreciate it. I'm gonna post it again real quickly. Um, that way you can open it up. And um, I am gonna end this session um, and then I'm going to restart it um and uh for the next 25 minutes there'll just be uh some of these great posters uh oh i just accidentally posted this oh yeah because becca private messaged me so it's on private hold on let me post this again there we go thanks becca um i'm gonna end the recording i'm gonna uh as i mentioned end this session um and then i'll restart it there'll just be some music playing and these posters for this year's night out for safety and liberation will be up on the wall. So feel free to jump back on and have it in the background. If not, join us at 7 p.m. Thanks, Christian. Thanks, uh, Aaron. And thanks, everybody, for joining us.